Do I do anything for the intro? You just listen and respond. Oh, okay. As the spirit moves you. Oh, it, don't ask me weird questions, baby. <laughs> <laughs> we recording? We going? Yeah. All right. Welcome to Living Stones, a podcast of conversations with the people of Red Mountain Community Church, highlighting the victories and struggles, the snapshots and stories of the people sitting right next to you on Sunday morning. I'm Peter Franson from Spirit Blade Productions and your fellow seat warmer at Red Mountain Community Church. My co-host today is our lead pastor, Kyle Fox, or as I may now forever know him, the guy who mows his lawn for fun. What happened? What happened? You remember when I asked you that yeah. on the episode of the podcast? I was just baffled. I was thinking about that yesterday because uh, after Sunday church, I went home and I mowed my lawn. Mm. And it was good? And it was great. And yeah. I was like, if Peter were to drive by, he would think this is the weirdest thing. Do, do you remember, like, could that have come from the farming days? Do you remember the farming days? Yeah. A, little bits and pieces. I was like three and a half when we moved, so I don't remember much. Okay. But... Is you that know, something you did with, you can with take, your dad? You can take the farmer away from the farm, but you can't take the farm out of the farmer. Yeah. So my or dad, the farmer's son, I guess. Sure. Yeah. It's just something in us, I guess. Did, did you like, was that like a thing you did with, with your dad growing up? Or like, is it just genetic at this point? Oh, I don't know. I, I worked with my dad yeah. on a number of things. So okay. probably I just uh, realized its value and... It, it's a uh, function in God's creation. So when you take time off, do you just mow the lawn every day? <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you going to do? I'm curious which, uh, this is actually a, a lame segue into the question I really wanted to ask. Um, hopefully, you know, I know that as a pastor, you are still busy in the thick of the Christmas season. I, you know, there are services and things like yeah. that, but, um, but hopefully you're going to get some time off uh, around about Christmas Eve time. Yeah. Good, good. So is there anything like you're looking forward to, to doing um, you and maybe with your family or whatever? Oh that yeah. Time? I mean, I'm enjoying just doing stuff with, with my family that's active. Like we like to go hiking. Okay. Uh, I like to play baseball with my kids. Uh, How old are you kids now? Oh, that, uh, that was a mean question. Six, four, <laughs> and uh, eight months. Okay. All right. So you like hiking, playing baseball? Yeah, just doing things outside because the weather's nice. And when school's out, that just has, gives us more time to just do things that are active and, and fun. So I'm, I look forward to that greatly. Cool. I've been looking forward to like the, the breaks probably for like the last, uh, two years, maybe more than usual, because my boys are now at that age where they can, they, and are enjoying some of the th same things that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. So every once in a while a video game or more recently, m uh, my youngest Titus, who is not just her nine now, uh, really likes being uh, what would be called the game master in this game called Hero Quest. It's a board game Milton Bradley put out like years ago. I got it when I was junior high. And mm. it's like one person, one player controls all the monsters on the board and up to four other players control like this group of heroes that are like going through the depths in like in Lord of the Rings, you know, and stuff and fighting the monsters and getting treasure and, and bringing peace to the land, you know? <laughs> so, and he sounds really, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I spent years being the, the, the bad guy and now he really likes being the bad guy. And so I get to be the heroes. It's kind of fun. Um, okay. If I'm I, glad Titus could be the bad guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really working out for me. <laughs> um, I don't think I've asked you this question. I've asked a number of the other pastors this one, but if you could have another skill set or talent that you don't currently have and had to choose another career, not that you want or dream of some other career, you have to choose another career um, that you'd be successful enough to support yourself in, what, what do you think you would choose? And it's a given that you'd be, you don't have to worry about being successful enough in this career, you know? Right. So you don't have to worry about that. You, you've got the skill set and whatever the circumstances to be successful enough to do this for a living. Oh, I would, I would choose something in the medical profession. Really? Yeah. 
I think I would I would love to I guess help people in that way. Yeah. So I guess it's the same thing of helping people. I can't <laughs> I can't think beyond that. Uh but I would love to be a doctor and like there's all kinds of great inroads that, that gives you. Are you messing with me? Because that is like the perfect transition <laughs> into uh, today's episode. Earlier today, uh, Kyle and I spent some time talking with Anne Lane, a missionary we, su- uh, we support doing work in Uganda. Uh, she came to tell us about the nature of that work and what she sees God doing in it. So here's that conversation now. Well, Anne, thanks for doing this and and taking time to talk with us about what you're up to, which uh, I'm really curious to just kind of hear uh, come out. Um, what what just in a nutshell, or in a if you want to unpack a huge nutshell and just put it messy all <laughs> over the table, what kind of missionary work are you doing in Uganda? Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be able to share. But um, the main work that I'm doing this term has been and going forward I think will be trauma care training so Mm. to unpack that a little bit um, basically trying to share with ministry leaders with pastors with whoever will listen uh, how trauma impacts how trauma and abuse impacts people oh so we're talking about like emotional trauma yeah okay gotcha uh, emotional physical sexual whatever you want to term but um, how does it impact us how does it impact our us physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, and how, um, with God's help, can we begin to heal from that? Hmm. So it's a pretty broad, huge, ginormous issue. Wow. (laughs) Not just with, I mean, when I first went, I was working with women at risk, whatever that means, but the Lord has opened up doors in the last three years, especially to also do the training with um, both men and women, which is very interesting growing up. Southern Baptist, not teaching men. I've had to do oh. all these mental gymnastics in my head of, how sure. am I allowed to do this? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but just having the opportunity to share, you know, biblically, what does God say about trauma and abuse and hmm. how can we begin to heal from that and how does it impact us and stuff? So hmm. it's been pretty, pretty busy. <laughs> now, before we recorded, you mentioned, uh, it sounds like you've been out there for about 10 years. Is that right? Um, seven. Seven. Okay. Yes, seven years. But it been, you mentioned 10 years since you'd been at a Red yes. Mountain Christmas. Yes. So is that the, has that been the nature of the work over those seven years or is it kind of morphed into that? Or? Um, my first term, which was from 2012 to 2015, it was really more doing language study and culture acclimation and that type of stuff. And okay. at the very, very end, I started doing a couple of small groups with um, the, the curriculum that I use called By His Wounds, which is actually created by um, Mending the Soul, which some people at Red Mount may be familiar with, Mending yeah. the Soul Ministry. So it's that it's their curriculum specifically that they've um, written for Africa. Oh, okay. So I did a couple small groups with some women thinking that would possibly be what I would be doing because that's what I did here. And okay. then when I went back, um, God just started literally throwing doors open for training of entire ministries, um, open doors up to teach it as a class at one of the Bible colleges, at one of the Christian universities and that type of stuff. So it's been, um, quite not what I expected, but really, really cool. How have you seen those? Cause some might say, man, three years, 2012 to 15, that's a long time to learn language and culture, but you know, our philosophy is to have a long-term view of missions. Mm -hmm. How have you seen that time, the investment there and the culture language help your impact in the last couple of years? Um, It's definitely, well, one of the things that's been really interesting is in the language time, you learn what they don't have words for. So there's not even a word in Luganda. Now granted there's 40 tribal languages in Uganda. I'm learning one. Wow. <laughs> so, um, but there's not even a word for trauma. Oh, so wow. we're like making kind of, how can we describe that? So we're using the term ebi wundumumatima, which means wounds of the heart. So oh. we're not just talking about the physical wounds, but we're also talking about the heart wounds. Mm. But also there's not words for a lot of emotions. So you start talking about feelings, which they don't talk about. And then you like, even through a translator talking about different types of emotion and they'll just stop and look at you like, what am I supposed to say? And so mm. you kind of have to describe 
around it. So you begin to pick up parts within the culture of they're not used to talking about this stuff. They don't mm. want to talk about this, but they don't even have words to talk about this stuff. So wow. how do we help them feel safe enough and how do we begin to draw that out of them? Wow. I hope that answers sort of quite the question. Why do you think it is? <laughs> yeah, that, that helps. Um, you know, just thinking about a lot of times we rush into situations because we think we know the answers and we can help people and care for them. But when we're talking about trauma and years of, of different types of abuse, that's really hard to walk people through that. And so knowing culture and knowing lang language has got to be helpful. It's, it's uh, vital in a lot of ways just to understand that, I mean, parts of the different types of abuses that we discussed, that is part of their culture. That's they don't see it as wrong. They don't see it as not what God intended. So in a lot of ways, you're going all the way back to the beginning of Scripture to say, but this is what God intended. This is what God wants. And so how do we begin to and it's amazing how their eyes are opened and they're like, oh, that's not supposed to happen. It's like hmm, hmm. not what God planned anyway. So, oh. yeah. So um, take me back. A uh, number of years ago, how did you arrive at the conclusion that God wanted you to do uh, work there? And, and then if it kind of evolved, how did you uh, arrive at the conclusion that God wanted you to move into the, the specific work that you're doing now? Um, I had absolutely zero aspirations to do missions. Huh. I was a pharmacist in America. I worked for Banner House for several years while I was in Phoenix. And just um, going on a medical mission trip with a doctor that I met down in Mexico on a medical mission trip, she asked me to come to Kenya. And I went with her thinking, ooh, cool, safari. Hmm. And came back to America thinking, oh, I'm not supposed to live here anymore. Hmm. And went back two years later and felt the Lord asking me, are you willing to come? All along, he'd been sort of developing my heart for discipleship. I don't consider myself an evangelist at all. I'm more of a discipleship. My giftings are such that you go and sit in the muck with people hmm. that are hurting and try to figure out with them what God is up to and where God is in it. Hmm. Um, part of that was just my own story and my own story of healing. So... Um, going back to Kenya that time and the Lord saying, are you willing to come? Because one of the things you learn, they teach us since, um, when anytime you talk about any type of mission class, they'll tell you this, but Christianity, they say Christianity in Africa is a mile wide and an inch deep. Hmm. So a lot of people have heard the gospel, but they haven't had a lot of discipleship. Okay. And so that's my heart. And so he asked me, he's like, are you willing to go? Because discipleship is something that's really hard to do short term. You can't go over there in three weeks and like, Oh, look, I've discipled all these people. Yeah. It, involves, it involves walking with people through life and that type of stuff. So, mm. um, yeah, he told me to repair, prepare and he sent me to seminary and I fought the whole time because I'd already done grad school like twice. I'm like, no more school. <laughs> 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 but um, it was actually a really great experience. And then got appointed and like I said before, was sort of going to work with women at risk didn't really know what that meant. Um, around the time that I got appointed with World Venture, my mission agency, uh, actually went through the training and started working with Mending the Soul here at Red Mountain. And Mending the Soul was started by one of the seminary professors at Phoenix Seminary. So I'd started, um, part of the reason I really loved Mending the Soul and the curriculum so much. It's a it's a support group, a lay-led support group for abuse survivors, but it's so meshed with my own healing journey. My mm. own healing journey had started like 10 years before that, but it's so meshed with it as we talk about shame and talk about the effects of trauma and how it's related to the lies that we're believing and that type of thing and really getting back to the truth of what God says about us and what he says about himself and what he says about other people. Mm. Um, so all along, I kind of had this feeling when I got to the field that he would somehow use that because it was something that was dear to my heart because of my own journey. And there's um, walking with people even in, the, in the, the groups here at Red Mountain is amazing to watch God work in people's lives in that way. I just didn't know how that would work out. And 
he continues to surprise me hmm. weekly of how he's working it out. So hmm. <laughs> it's really, really cool. Wow. So then uh, how did you, I think you mentioned that like the, the ministry's changed a little bit where originally it was focused on connecting with women and mm-hmm. then it kind of has grown and changed into uh, connecting with men. Talk a little bit about kind of like how those changes uh, seem to be coming about and, and your, uh, uh, and, and how you realized, okay, I should step into that too. It, it really was more, uh, the doors that were opened of who wanted the training and I haven't done any advertising at all. It's just been doors have opened. I mean, I did go and talk to the people at Kest and said, you know, what's Kest? What's I'm Kest? sorry. <laughs> sorry. Kampala evangelical. Evangelical School of Theology, okay, and it's one of the Bible colleges there, sorry. Um, but just kind of, I did go talk to them and say, you know, would this be an option as a potential elective class for some of your um, counseling students or pastors or whatever? But really, all of the other ones have been, I would tell people about the curriculum, they would tell somebody else, that ministry leader would come and say, hey, can you come and train my staff? Mm. It's like, okay. And um, really, that's how it has sort of evolved. I mean, there's been a couple that, um, friends of mine that I've, that I've known and worked with like during my first term. And she's like, I really want you to come and train our mentors for Hope Alive. And I'm like, okay, fine. And so it just has kind of evolved in that way. And, um, yeah, it's been really interesting to do mixed groups when mm. you're talking about these things. Cause one of the things that the, the African curriculum has added is a section on the value and dignity of women. So we're talking about well, what did God intend at creation and how did Jesus treat women and how did mm. the first century church view women? And that's extremely countercultural mm. <laughs> for the most part in Uganda with different tribes and stuff. Mm. Um, so we get in some, some pretty heated discussions when you're um, there amongst mixed company. But yeah. then everybody also knows. So like... One of the art exercises at the end of it is, um, the question for the women is, draw a picture of how you're viewed in your culture. Mm. The question to the men is, draw a picture of how you view women in your oh, culture. Oh, interesting. And then draw a picture of how Jesus views women. Interesting. And both male and female do that question. Okay, yeah. Well, the, quest- the, the pictures, nine times out of 10, I mean, it's probably 98% of the time, the pictures that the women drew of how they feel and the men draw of what they perceive are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. There's no disparity, Mm -hmm. but it's still not. But then you look at the picture of how Jesus treated them and they realize, wow, that's really, really different. Mm -hmm. That's where the disparity exists. Yeah. 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 So... So now on to what you said is one of your uh, least favorite questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and modify it a little bit. My original version, which was not very good, was what does your day-to-day routine look like? And you mentioned that there's you know, not really a day-to-day. So week-to-week or however you want to couch it, month-to-month, whatever. I guess I, I'm just interested in kind of the nuts and bolts a bit of, uh, yep. of what you're doing over there with your routines. It's, um, it really depends. It, it changes by the week. It changes by the month. It changes by what classes I have going on and Mm. what I don't have going on. Usually Mondays was sort of set aside for doing some stuff with the field. Um, There's kind of a structure within, you know, the mission. My fellow missionaries from Royal Venture, kind of we have the team. And so kind of doing some stuff for the team. And then um, language study after that. So the first three years I was doing actually language study where I was learning conversational Um, and that type of thing. More recently in this past term, my language teacher has come and we've done more translation work. So all of the work that I was doing teaching out in Masaka with um, the ladies, it's who I worked with in the first term as well. We actually went through the book of Luke using the journal that we used here at Red Mountain or that you guys use here at Red Mountain. So a lot of that translating of that for them into Luganda, because we did that Bible study pretty much all in Uganda with a translator helping me. Okay. Um, so Mondays and Fridays, I think I'd meet with the language teacher at different times, depending on when I add class, um, usually on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, depending on what days it's set up, we would do class. The classes usually would run three hours um, a day, one day a week for about eight to 10 weeks, depending on what they could do. 
Uh, some of the classes were only about, you know, 10 kilometers outside of Kampala, but sometimes that 10 kilometers can take you an hour and a half to get there. Uh -huh. So your three hour teaching turns into five and six hours of yeah. getting back and forth. And, um, yeah, I was involved for my own personal sort of well-being, uh, Bible study with women, um, expats. So that met on Wednesday mornings. What's the expats? Sorry. Um, sorry, expatriates. <laughs> so people from any other country, not Uganda. So okay. I would be considered an expat there. Okay. But, um, so ladies from all over America, Europe, other African countries, um, even Asian countries and stuff. And we had a group that would meet together for Bible study and um, that was usually on Wednesday mornings. Sometimes then I'd run errands after that. And, you know, even going to the grocery store is not, oh, I'll just run to Walmart and grab everything I need. No, yeah. it's like you go to four or five different grocery stores hmm. and nothing is easy to do in Kampala because traffic is horrid. Hmm. And, um, yeah, so it just... I don't know. You just kind of get into whatever routine. I usually will like look on Sunday afternoons. It's like, okay, what do I have this week? And figure out what I need to do and what days is, can my driver going to come and work and what days is he not and mm. that type of stuff. So, yeah. So I in hope the, that explains a lot, at least a little. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so in the, in the middle of all that, given all, all with those activities and things in mind, what would you say are the parts of uh, the work you're doing that play to your strengths and your passions? And then which parts would you say are more challenging? Um, I absolutely love walking with people and seeing light bulbs go off and literally seeing God lift, begin to lift off mantles of shame that they've carried for years and years and years. Mm. Um, there's nothing better than doing that. And that takes um, just gifts of um, compassion and empathy and just service and, and encouragement and all that other type of stuff. Um, so that is wonderful. It's like I know without a shadow of a doubt that I'm doing exactly what God created me to do, and there's mm. not anything better than that. Mm. Um, at the same time, some of those same strengths of empathy and um, those type of things have also made it very hard because you hear their stories. Mm. And so you carry part of the weight of that as they, hmm. most of them have never told parts of their story to anybody before. Mm. And that's true here as well. Um, doing many of the soul groups here, but uh, because of my own story and because of my own just desire that, that I'm, I'm still even now wrestling with God on the, yes, I know you're sovereign, but where's the justice? Mm. Because there isn't, mm. you don't see that part. And so you can't, you know, when they're asking why you can't, you have no answer. Yeah. And when you say, well, what's going to be done about it? And it's like, you don't really have an answer, you know, mm. at some point God will exact his justice, but, um, it's really hard carrying that weight sometimes. So in a way it's sort of a double edged sword. Like I love what I do, but at mm -hmm. the same time it's hard. Hmm. What's been encouraging in that you, you, that God seems to be doing something there. What would you say God seems to be doing through the work there? Um, it's, you, I can see the potential, I guess, especially a couple of the different groups that I've done and the, the impact that they have and how excited they are to receive this new information. A lot of times their knowledge is power. So when they, a lot of times when they receive new information or new knowledge, they'll hold on to it because that means that they somehow have power over another person. So I tell them all the time, it's like, I'm not sharing this information hmm. with you for you to hold on to it. I'm sharing this information with you for you to go and share it with other people and mm. help them heal as you've healed and that type of thing. Um, so to see some of them really catch that vision and want to go and share that. Um, I did a intensive, which basically means we do the entire training in five days instead of spreading it out over eight to 10 weeks okay. in a village out in the West. And they were excited and on fire and the way their ministry is set up, they have the potential to completely change an entire community out there, hmm. um, which is really, really cool to see and have heard from 
some of their leadership here in the States about what they've been doing and stuff even since I've been back and that type of stuff, which is really, really encouraging. So I have to go back and follow up with them when I get back. But, um, but just, I think one of the coolest things too was on that same intensives, a couple of Ugandans that had been through the training, that had been through the facilitator training, one of them even being my driver, um, started helping me to teach the class. It oh. wasn't just leading and, and doing the, the small group discussion, but actually stepping into, okay, I'm going to teach this part of the curriculum, wow. which was uber exciting. Yeah. Like, oh amazing. Gosh. Cause I tell them all the time, it's like, I need to work my way out of a job. So mm. Mm. <laughs> you guys need to step up. So, yeah. <laughs> so oh, yeah, that's cool. but that's been really, really cool. And even to have Ken, my driver tell me, he's like, I want to do more of this stuff. And I'm like, okay, we'll figure it out. So wow. Yeah. How uh, and we were talking about God healing people, and and I think biblically speaking, seems like and even just from what I've seen, both in Kampala and in various places, is that God uses the truth to heal. Absolutely. And you even said like knowledge is power. When when you get in these classes and when you get in these trainings and when you're just talking one on one. Do you feel like, as you've done this over the course of the last four years, is there one or two truths that you, like, know you need to share with people and that you've seen have had a big healing impact? Um, I think just, I would say it for those that um, I have stepped into their journeys with them on a, on a closer level, but also even in my own, just the absolute unconditional, there's nothing you can do to mess it up. Love that God has for us. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of performance there. There's a lot of expectations. You have to like, the that's kids not true are, here. No, no not at, at all. all ever. No. <laughs> <laughs> as, a recovering, it's over there. Yeah. as a recovering performance addict, it's not an issue at all. Um, but just that, but, but that's what I mean. Like truly as a, I mean, I performed most of my life and when God showed me that truth, it was like 90% of my performance issues went out the door in a day. Um, I still struggle at times, but at that particular time, it was like, I don't care what other people think of me because I know that my creator loves me. Mm. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, but yeah, the whole idea of, you know, John 8, that's like my life verse. It's like, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Mm. But part of the journey that I'm on with people is helping them identify the lies because they've believed it all their life. So that is their truth. So helping them see that that's not what God's truth is though, mm. that that's something that culture has told them or that's something that they have just come to believe because of the situations that they found themselves in or um, what they've been told or whatever. So part of that is, and there's freedom in that too, just identifying that, oh my gosh, it, it shakes you because that has been your foundation. But when you realize that it is the lie that it is and begin to search truth for that, there is freedom even in identifying the lie as you continue to get truth. Those light bulb moments are amazing. They're it, the coolest thing ever. <laughs> it really is when you see, and oh, that's what motivates us for, the work of the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. Is to see people, it, they just, it, it's a, the best way to describe it is a light bulb. It just mm -hmm. comes on you all of a sudden their life just is, they view their life and their world differently. Yep. Yeah. And the gospel, the truth of Jesus really does do that. Yep. Absolutely. And you see it. I mean, I'm in situations of trauma, I feel like it's so clear because of the kinds of deception mm -hmm. going on there. Mm -hmm and the kinds of cultural masks that uh, you're able to get rid of. Yep. It's great. And it's still difficult because they're like, well, culture says, I'm like, okay. And I mean, most of the ones that I've done teachings with, they're, they call them belocale or born again. So they're belocale and I'm like, okay, but you're saying culture says this, but this is the scriptures. I'm not giving you my view. I'm telling you, this is the scriptures, mm -hmm. which is higher. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, well, the Bible. I'm like, okay. It's like, 
And I, I can't tell you how many times I come back to that. They're like, well, culture says, and I'm like, all right, but what does the scripture say? Let's look. Hmm. Um, so it's really, really cool. And, and Kyle, there was something that you said when I was meeting with you guys in the um, Preston and the Lee and stuff in our meeting when I got back that I hadn't thought about before that was really cool, but there is no better place in some ways to be able to make disciples than when you are meeting in them in the trauma because you're getting to shine light on the lies and you're getting to shine light on where God is and what he's up to and hmm. and setting people free. And I hadn't necessarily thought about, it's like, oh, I'm just doing trauma care, but it really is disciple making because you're showing them the truth of who God is and who we are in his eyes in that time. Yeah. It's the main work the Spirit's doing in each of our lives is saying, hey, these are the lies. Mm -hmm. Here's the truth. Mm -hmm. And the truth really does set us free. Yeah. Both the moment when you first... Yeah. Made that connection. <laughs> when, you first come, <laughs> when you first become a Christian, there's a big truth moment. Yeah. Whoa. But then he undoes all the other lies that we've been holding on to or believing or ignorantly following. Hmm. So... What would you like to see God do next? And how can us as your family at Red Mountain be praying for you to that end? Um, I, my biggest prayer is probably that more Ugandans would see the value, I guess, and, and, and get on board, if you want to call it that, and mm -hmm. really start taking hold of this and really wanting to share and not just sharing because... You're, or not even just coming to class because they get their certificate, but mm -hmm. that they actually take it to heart and that they, you know, I tell them all the time, as God begins to heal in your heart, you can't help but tell other people what he's done. Yeah. You don't have to fear telling your story. You don't have to fear. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, because of all the shame and all the other stuff and the secrecy, there's not a lot of trust mm. amongst many Africans, I think, because I know it's in Rwanda as well, but in, in Uganda, there's not a lot of trust. Like they would much more likely come to me and tell me because I'm from the West and I know how to keep a secret. Hmm. Um, but, supposedly, <laughs> <laughs> but they, they're much more likely to trust me with that than they would each other. And my hope is that they would, as they realize there's so many more people out there that have similar stories that they don't have anything to be ashamed of. And the shame is what keeps us quiet anyway, that they would begin to trust one another and heal with one another. And, um, that they would sort of catch the vision and that I can at some point begin to kind of step back and let them lead. And I support them and encourage them and push them forward. But Truly, I, I really do want to retire in 15 years, so that's mm. a lot of work to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think just that more Ugandans would sort of step into that, that even pastors and leadership um, would see the value. Like I, even the church that I attend, um, you know, they have an outreach that they do. It's a medical outreach it does amazing things for that one week, but I just see the opportunity of whether it's Kampala Baptist, where I prayed from, or even UCF, um, which we've Red Mountains partnered with for years, like sort of putting on the, the glasses, so to speak, of trauma and actually approaching everything is sort of trauma informed is what the kind of buzzword kind of is here now. Okay. But being able to do outreaches and stuff with that in mind and having that compassionate response and an, an, an understanding response um, would be amazing. Hmm. And um, so yeah, just that more opportunities are opened and that more people see the value of it and step up into it, I think are the two main things. Okay. Kyle, did you have anything to add or ask at the end here? Uh, yeah, Peter. <laughs> well, why don't you go ahead and do that? <laughs> <laughs> what time? I, I have a number of thoughts that I'm trying to wade through, Anne. Um, what, what, um, I think what's important for us to understand is that the gospel just hasn't been in Uganda that long. We're talking about 150 years at most. Oh, wow. And so... Much of, much of how Christianity functions in Mesa is a result of centuries yeah. of Christian gospel development and church development. Mm -hmm. And so when we 
when we go to a place like Uganda, we have to be very careful of our expectations mm. of of how the culture is even functioning because the truth of the gospel just hasn't hasn't invaded it fully. And I think part of the truth of the gospel is for the culture to recognize the traumatic effects of sin in their lives mm -hmm. and how entrenched their culture really is in sin. So they don't have words for that, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. they just haven't, that truth that, that God brings us hasn't invaded yet. Yeah. So how, you know, how... <laughs> That's just, a, I, I don't even know how to ask a question in light of that, except to say that's a hard work, And It's a really hard work. And that's one of the things that's been kind of in some ways the most frustrating. It's like they have, one of my teammates explained it as many of her Ugandan friends who are strong believers, or they would consider themselves strong believers, or have the ability to hold two completely contradictory things mm. in their head as both true. Hmm because it's somehow done in stages. There's not a black and white of, well, this is sin and this isn't. Mm -hmm. It's, well, this is a bigger sin. So this is, I don't know. <laughs> what? And it's, I it's, it's, it's hard. And it's, I think that's part of what um, is, is, I don't want to say frustrating, but it, it's, it's sometimes I feel like I'm beating my head against the wall. It's like, oh my gosh, how many times do I have to have this conversation? And a lot of times it's even, it's coming in because so much of the teaching, and again, people could say, oh, we have bad teaching in America too. Yes, we do. But there's so much teaching. I feel like a lot of times I'm going, like I said, back to the very beginning of, well, what does it mean to be forgiven? And what does assurance of salvation look like? And um, no, if you don't ask forgiveness and you go hit, get hit by a motorcycle taxi and die mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you're going to go to hell it's like it's been but fighting not really fighting but just trying to continually teach that same again and again and again mm -hmm. and then having pastors that you truly 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 respect be like well, yeah and i understand what you're saying but we, we just need to give them rules it's like, uh, okay <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah and it just seems like the work you know paul calls it the and Jesus used the phrase of building up the church, equipping mm -hmm. the church. And it seems like that's not able to be done in a century. Otherwise, Jesus right. would have come back already. Right. <laughs> He's still building his church. Absolutely. And we have a great task, not just be, as Americans who have things figured out, because we don't, but as followers of Jesus, we have a great responsibility to partner with him in that building up of the church. Mm -hmm. And that happens in Mesa, in, you know, Texas, in Uganda, in... Throughout the world. Throughout the world. Yeah. And that's the, that's the greatness of the work that I, I'm hoping people are pondering as we listen to Anne, is that that big work of building the church is incredibly important because the healing of souls is at stake. Hmm. It's not just so we can have a nice church. It's yeah. people are in bondage and they need help. They need salvation. And Jesus does it. All you have to do is share who he is mm -hmm. and share the truths of, of scripture. And it's amazing the healing that can happen. Well, I'm hoping that somewhere down the line, we can have you back to chat again and just kind of get to an update and hear more about what's going on. But this has been great to just get a sense to take it out of the realm of theory, mm -hmm. you know, cause some people might've heard about what you're doing and uh, know that, you know, part of their giving here at the church is going toward that, you know, but to really just kind of unpack it right now has been really good. So thank you for being willing to Absolutely. do this. And I just want to throw out a shameless plug and y'all can edit this out if you want no, to, yeah. but <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> Mending the Soul Ministry is amazing, hmm. and I would just really encourage, I can't tell you when I read on some update somewhere, I think it was Connie had posted something on one of the Facebook groups or whatever that I'm in, that um, Red Mountain had two male facilitators, and I literally was in Uganda doing the happy dance, hmm. that we had male facilitators here at the church, because, hmm. you know, we've been doing the women's group for quite some time, but... Um, Everybody's hurting. It's mm. not just a women's issue of abuse. It's everybody's hurting. Mm. And people will say, well, 
you know, I don't have any of that big stuff. And I'm like, it doesn't matter the big stuff, whether it's a big, whether it's a big hairy monster in the closet or whether it's just, gosh, I've been disappointed because we live in a fallen world. Hmm. We all have pain that it helps sometimes to talk about within the group. So, um, just want to put a shameless plug out there for many of the soul groups because they are something that's, I know it's made an impact on my life. Like I said, my journey started years before that, but it, um, it's a very good place, a very strong, um, a lot of doctrine, a lot of biblical truths, a lot of social science into it. It's, 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 it's kind of all encompassing. So it's a really good opportunity to, to really begin to walk that journey and get healing. Yeah. Great. No, I appreciate that coming up both now and then also earlier in the conversation, because I think that that, you know, as, as you pointed out, Kyle, you know, this is, these are, uh, these are needs that humans have all over the world, you know? And Mm -hmm. so, uh, and so hopefully, you know, somebody listening to this, who's maybe not, uh, looked for help or, uh, or community to, uh, to find healing in that uh, maybe they'll take a next step to do that. Um, I hope they will, but thank you again so much for doing this. Thank you. Well, I learned a whole bunch about what Anne was doing. I, I can't, I don't remember what I thought she was doing, but it was different than what mm. she was doing. So that was, I was like, you know, like totally uh, sitting forward and uh, interested in, in, I mean, the, the whole ministry, the nature of what she's doing there is, you know, typically when you think of, you know, like uh, ministry going on in Africa, it's got something to do with food, you know, foods. <laughs> foods or digging wells. Yeah, yeah. Foods in the equation, something, you know, with getting people food and nourishment, you know, is usually like the, the, the popular thing. But to understand, and, and, and it makes so much sense that this would be the case, that there's all these issues of personal trauma that people, that is so common there. Um, I, I'm curious, what stood out to you in our time talking with Anne? Well, I think it's, it's just what, what you're talking about there, Peter, is that we, we tend to view people only by the by the, I guess, quote unquote, issues you see on the surface. So hmm. like we're going to send food or we're going to send medical care okay, or yeah. we're going to dig a well or those sorts of things. And and the tendency is for missions to start focusing on meeting those needs. And what, what you see and doing is actually digging deeper and trying to figure out, it's not just about those surfacing needs, but let's try to dig underneath to figure out what's actually going on to uncover the lies that Satan is, is, uh, having a heyday with in the culture. Mm -hmm. And that's the root of all of the other things on the surface that we're seeing of corruption of government and Mm -hmm. lack of physical resources, all those sorts of things. There's deeper things that the gospel can get to and speak to that help people heal people, but can actually help the country. Mm -hmm. It can help communities uh, experience a turnaround in the physical sense to where they're, they're, uh, they're developing and, and, uh, and becoming just more of a healthy uh, society more of living how God intended life to be lived. Yeah. I think I've heard a number of times over the years that like, theoretically, there is plenty of food that could be created for everyone in Africa mm-hmm. that ultimately what it comes down to is a, a corruption issue, a sin issue, you know? Yeah. And again, not that we ignore the physical problems sure. or those sorts of things, but yeah. you know, that no one has to install sprinklers there. It mm. rains so much, you put a seed in the ground and it grows. Mm. It's a matter of, of man, who owns that land? Mm. And how do you figure out land ownership? Mm. And, and uh, how do you cultivate that in a healthy way? And all sorts of issues that go into food production, again, that are symptoms of deeper issues that Jesus is wanting to speak to and wanting to help people work through. And the truth, that's, that's what stuck, stuck, stuck out to me so much about what Anne was saying. It's just, it's the communication of basic scriptural truths that turn light bulbs on for people. Yeah, The truth really does set people free. It's very basic. It's not complicated. Anne is going over there to speak truth. Yeah. 
She does that in a variety of ways and creative ways, all those sorts of things. But that is the basic sense of what we as ministers of the gospel do. We speak the truth in love. Yeah. Uh, man, this podcast is hard to do because there's, you know, <laughs> we're getting into this great stuff, this great meaningful stuff. And I always try to, you know, by now you're probably thinking, well, what's Goofy Pater going to do to segue in the thing? And blah, blah. I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing this month. We're just doing the poll and we're going to just do it like we're just like ripping off a Band-Aid here. So this is a poll segment. Uh, rmcchurch.org slash podcast is where you can go, I think, right? For the, I, that's the URL I keep saying every month. I hope it's been right. rmcchurch.org slash podcast to uh, check out our poll question. The poll question this month was, what's the best part of Thanksgiving dinner? Mashed potatoes or stuffing? We had over 100 people who voted across our Instagram and Facebook pages. Erin, is that a record? 100? It's up there. She thinks it's so. up there. I feel like there's been some months... I feel like there's been some months where it's like six. We got six respondents. I'm like, well, this does not represent the lifeblood of Red Mountain Community <laughs> Church. Six people. 100, over 100 people. Um, 63% said mashed potatoes. Obviously. Is the best part. Uh, and, and we only gave them two choices again because, I don't know, 37% said stuffing. One person commented, how can you choose well, they should probably get in touch with one of the over 100 people who are able to figure that out, right? Uh, another claimed her grandmother has the best recipes. I would like to see this person produce this so-called grandmother because I don't think, you know what? They can't produce her. Why? Because we've got her right here. Come on in, Grandma. No, we don't. <laughs> don't worry. She's fine as far as I know. I mean, still check just in case. Kyle, mashed potatoes or stuffing? What do you uh, think? Obviously mashed potatoes. Really? Do you put yeah. anything on it? Gravy. Okay. Did you get like the packet gravy, the canned no. gravy, or you make it out of the grease no, stuff? No, Sarah, Sarah makes this gravy that's just fantastic. Mm, yeah. And she infuses the potatoes with stuff like garlic and salt and butter and all those good, mm. good things. Mm. It's um, not overkill. It doesn't, it's, it's, no, it's not overkill. Okay. It's all heavenly. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so good. I, I was thinking... We need to have some sort of church event where everybody brings like their best Thanksgiving mm. recipe mm. and we just have... It's like just the pieces of paper or like the things made? The things made okay, and we just yeah, have the better. meal to end all meals. Mm. And maybe Jesus would show up. Maybe that would cause him to come back. <laughs> and then he'd be like, hey, this is the meal. Uh, I, um, I mean, I got to go with option three as usual, I think. Costco buns. The Costco rolls. That's the your rolls favorite you get. Thanksgiving thing. You know what? Two big bags of that. That's one of the main things we're bringing to contribute to the family meal. This I'm kind of hoping a little bit that everyone kind of forgets to show up and then we can just take all the, take the, all the rolls, dinner rolls home and I can just have like rolls and rolls and rolls for days and days. Oh, that sounds amazing. It Peter. is. It is. <laughs> um, all right, that's it for this episode of Living Stones. You can follow Red Mountain Community Church at MyRedMTN on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also go online to rmcchurch.org slash podcast to submit responses to our poll questions and leave questions for the guests featured on the next show. On our next episode, we're going to be talking with Kelly Hall, and Kelly's going to share how God demonstrated his faithfulness and care in the tension and complexity of raising a family with special needs and in the midst of frequent military moves and ongoing chronic illness. You can go online to rmcchurch.org slash podcast to submit your question for Kelly. You may just hear it read on the next episode. In the meantime, I'm Peter Franson. I'm Kyle Fox. Still? Yep. All right. Thanks for listening. See you on Sunday. Drop this mic. Those are mics are freaking built, man. Are they? They look like it. <laughs>